Hello, Chemistry 12. This is Mr. Chan. And in this lesson, this is the second lesson in the Chemistry 11 review uh, for the solubility unit for Chemistry 12. Now, last day, remember, we talked about the definitions in regards to what was a ionic solution, an ionic solution, a molecular covalent solution, what was solubility, and we also did a little bit of concentration calculation. So my hope is, is that you've had some time to review and you are able to sort of um, bring back up to speed some of the things that you should have learned from Chemistry 11. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about today in, from Chemistry 11 is talking about the dilutions. It's used when mixing two liquids together and wanting to know the concentration of the substances in the final solution or resulting solution. Now you notice that I have square brackets uh, on around the word substances and that is basically a shorthand way of saying concentration. Now generally one can use the formula M1V1 is equal to MFVF uh, now, depending on what your teacher did, uh, whoever your teacher was, they might have done something in regards to, you know, C1V1 or C2V2, that sort of stuff. Okay. And remember, the reason why you can do this is because the number of moles of the solution, okay, remains constant. So when you are um, doing dilutions, why dilutions work is because of the fact that the moles of the solution remain constant before and after dilutions, okay? Now, so let me give you an example here. So what is the final concentration of the ions when you mix 425 mils of 0.842 molarity aluminum nitrate and 318 mils of 0.525 molarity Ki? Now, so the first thing you want to do is you notice the key word is you want to mix. And what you have is in this case, you have one solution of aluminum nitrate and you have another solution of Ki. So these are key words in terms of identifying what you need to do and to do dilutions. So the first thing is you want to do the dilutions Okay, dilution calculation for each solution. So for the concentration of aluminum nitrate, oopsie, what happens is, so we have brackets three here. So what that would be, would be 0 0.842 molarity times 425 mils all over 743 mils, okay? And if we do that, we do 0.842 times 425 divided by 743, I get an answer of 0 0.482 molarity. Now, Again, when you're doing dilutions, what you want to do is make sure that the volumes have the same units. So in this case, what I can do is I can just cancel out the mils. Now, this is different than when we were doing molarity calculations. In that particular case, what we had to do was we want to make sure that the units of our um, volume was in liters. But when we do dilutions, it does not matter whether we change them to liters or keep them in milliliters, so long as the units stay the same. Now, if we do the same thing for Ki, so we do the concentration of Ki, what we have here is we would have uh, 0 0.525 molarity times 318 mils all over 743 mils. And what I would get in this particular case, times 318 divided by 743. So in this case, what would I have is I would have 
200, oh, sorry, 0 0.225 molarity. Okay, now that would be the first step. The second step now would be, I would do, do the dissociation equation. So dissociation equation. for each of my solutions. Okay, so in this particular case, if we had aluminum nitrate, so what I would do is I would go aluminum nitrate, we'll break apart to aluminum plus three and three nitrates. And what you would have is you would have in this particular case, 0 0.482 molarity. Here would also be 0 0.0482 molarity. And here would be 0 0.482 times three. This would be 1.45 molarity. Remembering why is it 1.45 is because of the fact that it's following the mole ratio. Okay, now we do the exact same thing for Ki. So here we have Ki breaks apart into K plus and I minus one. And in this case, it's all a one to one to one ratio. So this would be 0 0.225 molarity. This would be 0 0.225, and the last one would also be 0 0.225, okay? Now, I am going through this a little bit quickly because of the fact that this should be a review of chemistry 11, okay? Now, the other thing is, when we talk about solutions, we need to talk about precipitation and generally occurs when one mixes two solutions together. Now, recall from chemistry 11, in this particular case, the products, this is determined by double replacement. That's what you should have learned back in chemistry 11. Now, but the question we have is notice the phases. In this particular case, PBI2 is a solid, while KNO3 has a phase of AQ, okay? Now, so generally when we talk about precipitation reactions, it would look something like this. So what you have is when you mix two clear liquids together, what you get is you get this sort of precipitate. That's right here. So you get this solid. This is what we call a precipitate. Okay, so this is what happens when you mix two solutions together, you get one substance that remains a solid. Now, the background to the reason why this happens is can be found in this particular a website, so I'm gonna leave it up to you to uh, go through it on your own, okay? So in class, I probably went through it, but for here, you should probably um, look, on, look at it on your own time. Now, how did I know that the PBI2 is a solid? And one can determine that by checking the solubility table. Now, remember back from chemistry 11, you would have this particular solubility table, okay? Now, so why was PBCl2 a solid? Is because, recall from chem 11, when you take the negative ion, which in this case was chlorine, and if you connected it with lead, what you would notice is that if you looked across, it said it was low solubility. And what does low solubility mean? It means that in this particular case, this combination 
stays as a solid in solution. So that is why when we take a look at our example, okay, whoopsie, it was up here, okay. This is why PBI2 was a solid. Whoops, I used PBI2, I used chlorine, but regardless, if I looked at iodine, same thing, okay? You get a low solubility, which stays as a solid in solution. Now, if I took a look at KNO3, okay, why did I put an AQ in the, uh, as a phase? Because notice here, you have nitrate and combines with anything, what you get is you get soluble. So what that means is soluble means that it dissolves in solution. So that's why I gave KNO3 the phase symbol of AQ. Okay. Now, again, this is a, something that you should have remembered from um, chemistry 11. Now, when we do these double replacement reactions, recall from chemistry 11 that there were three different ways to represent the equation. The molecular equation, complete ionic equation, and net ionic equation. Now, yeah, I want to show you uh, your book, your Hebden text. If you take a look on page number 84, okay, if we scroll down, okay, if you, oopsie, if you take a look on page number 84, okay, what happens is there a section 3.4, it says writing formula, complete and net ionic equations. And I'm going to leave it up to you to go through this particular section about how to write a formula equation, a complete ionic equation, and a net ionic equation. Now, if you take a look on the bottom of page 85, they do highlight something called the spectator ions. So what is the spectator ions? So I'm going to leave that up to you. And if you take a look on page number 86, they talk about the net ionic equations. Okay. So just something for you to be aware of. Again, I'm going through this a little bit quicker because of the fact that this is a review of chemistry 11. Okay. So going back to this screen. Okay. Now, one final thing, and then that will be it. In terms of the using the solubility table, using the solubility table, one can separate ions from solution. So an example would be how can one separate PO4 minus three or phosphate ions and chlorine ions from solution. So if I were to draw this, so let's say we had a solution that is a mix of phosphate, so PO4 minus three and chlorine minus one. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna separate each of them uh, independently. So what, how do we solve that is we can choose an ion that reacts or forms a solid with one, but not the other in solution. So in this particular case, using the solubility table, I want to find one that will react with phosphate or a solid with phosphate, but soluble with chlorine or vice versa. Okay, so what I have here is I have chlorine ions and phosphate ions. Okay, so I have chlorine ions here and I have phosphate. Now, so what I wanna do is I wanna choose one that is soluble in one, but not the other. So let's say, for example, I choose, let's say calcium. Now, why would calcium work is because calcium with chloride 
is soluble, okay? While phosphate with calcium, what that is, is not soluble, okay? So that is one thing I would like for us to be aware of. So going back to this particular example, what I could do is I could add calcium plus two. Now, why would calcium plus two? Because the calcium plus two forms a solid with PO4 minus three. So what happens here is, if we were to do this, I would have Cl minus one. And then what I would form is I would form a big puddle or a big solid of calcium three PO4 brackets two. So now I have my solid. So what I can do then is I can filter it. I can filter the Ca3PO4, brackets two, and then what I would have left is I would just have fluorine minus one. Okay, so the key thing is you want to want it to react with one, but not the other. Now, if we were to take a look at this, how would they reference this in your particular textbook? So if we go back here to your textbook, okay, if we scroll down, go through the net ionic equation, okay. Now, if you look on page 88, we talk about qualitative analysis. And what they do is they do this in sort of a table format. Now, this you might say, well, Mr. Chan, how is this similar to what you gave us as an example? Again, if you take a look, what you want in this particular case is you want to have one that react with one, but not the other. So in the bottom of the example on page 88, it says a solution contains one or more Ag plus, Ba plus two, and Ni plus two, what ions could be added? Now, if you look on the top of page 89, what you could do is you could say, oh, it says only Ag plus can be precipitated if chlorine is added. Therefore, first see if there's any Ag plus present by adding Cl minus one and filtering off any precipitate form. Now, why does Cl minus one work? Because notice chlorine minus one only reacts with the silver, okay? It does not react with barium. It does not react with nickel. So what happens is if there is anything, okay? So you react with one, okay? And then, you take out the silver and all you're left with is barium and nickel. And then the second one, notice here, now a choice exists. Either SO4 or S minus two can be added. Why those two is because they react with one and not the other. Sulfate reacts with barium, but doesn't react with nickel. Conversely, sulfur reacts with nickel, but not barium. So. This is the same idea with what I explained, how you want to have one chemical that reacts with one, but not the other. All right. Now, this was a quick review of the material that you should remember from Chemistry 11. Now, if you want a more detailed breakdown, I don't know if this is in your handout, but what you can do is go through videos numbers 34, 35, and 36 from my chemistry 11. And what, oopsie, and what that will do is that will sort of give you a little bit more details, some more sample calculations for you to refer to. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day.
Bye-bye.